today, a fantastic panel of sharp, engaged minds to discuss the potential political power of the silent majority. As James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. So we're gonna face it right now. So I wanna ask each of you about revisiting To Kill a Mockingbird in 2018 and the climate that we find ourselves in. What's it like for each of you? What has it been like for each of you uh, personally, even thinking about it? I'll start with you, Jesse, because I know you haven't seen it yet, but you've had to think about it in preparation for this, I'm sure. Well, that's actually what Nigel and I were talking about right before the panel was, I was just asking what it was like to even conceive of, of approaching the story mm-hmm. in, in the age of, of Trump. Um, because, you, you know, I think it is, there is risk there uh, uh, that your intention as an artist wrapped up with Harper Lee's intention as an artist, wrapped up with whatever happened that morning in the news yeah. means that the audience's relationship to that material is gonna really be ever evolving moment to moment. Uh, and that's interesting, especially, you know, yeah, in the political times we live in, in the discourse times we live in, um, in some ways there's comfort because I think art does that discourse better than the, the media does right now. So it's actually maybe better to sit in a play for two and a half hours yeah. and have that that like that as opposed to sit in front of CNN, which I can't imagine doing that for two and a half hours. Or sitting hours. on Twitter for two and a half or hours definitely or something don't do terrible. That. Tell me about engaging with the with the with the work to kill a mockingbird. Uh, I'll go with you, Nigel and then Irene. In the, in the beginning, I, th- I was I was incredibly uh, uh, trepidatious to to take on the project. I, I'm um, I'm uh, acutely aware of, uh, of of people's relationship with the novel and and the and the film. Um, but uh, I started I started working on this uh, last May. Uh, that's when Anthony asked me to take it on, and I I, I originally said no. I said no because because my relationship to To Kill a Mockingbird is is very different um, uh, f- uh, from others, and I think that from others I mean like a sort of like a, a, a Eurocentric, you know, patriarchal colonial point of view. Like I see I see that book, and my relationship with it is is through uh, a feeling of of racial injustice and and racism. I don't I, I never did uh, connect with it with uh, with a um, uh, a, a heroic sensibility to, to Atticus Finch. It's not that he, he there, you know, he he was in that time uh, 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 did uh, did uh, very heroic things. But for me, the 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 novel and the and the film had always sort of uh, marginalized me. It it marginalized um, uh, Calpurnia. Well, basically all all the all the black people that lived in Alabama in 1935. And so I was very curious about why um, the story. Uh, why Anthony wanted to tell the story, and then, and I sort of uh, sat back uh, a bit, and I, I realized the world that we were living in, um, and uh, and what was happening in the United States, and therefore how, what was trickling up um, uh, to Canada, and and the, uh, the 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 immigration policies that were happening in in Europe, and I was when I was realizing we said, we said this on the phone, like I I, I had the sense that un- unfortunately. We still live in a world in which the story needs to be told, mm-hmm. in which we we do need to have conversations about racism. We do need to have conversations about social injustice, and we do need to have uh, conversations about marginalization. Irene, what about you? About uh, in engaging with this, because you are playing the adult scout, and now you're reflecting back here, and uh, and you have this cast with you. Of it's a mixed, obviously mixed race cast. Um, and I just wonder about engaging with it and what, what amongst you and your castmates you were thinking or feeling when you had to confront the material. Well, um, I was in uh, Quebec last summer. I, I guess it was in August. I had just arrived, this 10-hour trek, two days with my two kids to the eastern townships. And literally, within the hour of arriving there, I got a note from my agent saying, can you come to the theater tomorrow and read for Jean Louise in Mockingbird? And I, I wrote back and said, I, I'm in Quebec. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I had the, the script 
emailed to me. I'd read the, the novel, of course, but it had been a long time. Mm -hmm. So I had the script emailed, and I remember so vividly sitting there in this beautiful, peaceful cottage in Quebec, reading the script, and at, at the exact same time, on the newscast, was um, a constant barrage of uh, images and voices from Charlottesville, North Carolina. And um, I couldn't even believe how uh, resonant everything I was reading in this play from, s from a story that set so long ago, uh, all these issues were in the news. And I remember sitting, I, it was quite beautiful, <laughs> again, this, this campfire with my, uh, with my aunt, who was in her um, early 70s, and sharing her experiences of growing up, you know, during an era when she thought we had, that she had fought all those battles for us, so we wouldn't have to continue to fight them. Um, so it, I think in those moments, I thought, this is important material. Um, it needs to be revisited because of things like Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, for me, began um, a real immersion into the civil rights movement, which I had never done before. Mm -hmm. I hadn't had cause to before, you know, to, to really explore what was happening, specifically in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. As Nigel and I were talking about getting started, you know, we were looking at 1964, 1968 in terms of a, a, a starting mm -hmm. point for Jean Louise. So, um, it was quite an education, I'll say, that immersion into specifically 1968. Today, we, we want to talk about how you find your voice within all this. If this, if this makes you feel uncomfortable, if, if, if seeing the way that the world is unfolding makes you feel uncomfortable, how do you push back against it? So I'm, I want to talk about pushing back and finding that inner courage to be a voice. We, you work in the arts in the arts sector, um, that's one way. But I wanna talk about the ways personally that you are pushing back against what we're seeing right now as being a very important time in our history. And I'll start with you, Irene. Well, I suppose as an artist, first of all, yeah. I, I think there's great power in storytelling. Um, as we were saying earlier, I, I mean, I, I sometimes joke with people who come up to me who have seen Mockingbird and tell me that they've been weeping nonstop for 45 minutes, and I, and I, and I jokingly say, well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to trap 2,000 people in a theater and make them cry. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, because I think, you know, the, the humanity on stage is a direct connection to every one of those audience members if they choose to open up and let us in there is um, immense love and empathy and j just humanity in what we are doing. We don't always get to do this as artists. Often we are doing shows that make people laugh or make them have no emotional connection at all. Unfortunately, that's just the way the business is. But when we have these opportunities, like we yeah. do in Mockingbird, yeah. to really, really try and have an impact so that maybe some of those audience members walk out with a different point of view on the world than when they walked in with, I think is extremely, um, it's, it's an, a, a privilege for me to, to think that I might have that amount of impact. Mm. And when Nigel and I started this process with Jean Louise, of looking at the, the play, you know, as a separate thing from the novel, because at some point you have yeah. to, you have to deal with the words you're given and the story that you're given on the page that you're dealing with. So for us, it was an investigation into Jean Louise's need to find that inner courage, to go back to find her scout, yeah. to find the child who yeah. believed that the world could be fixed if you just asked the right questions right. and trusted that the adults were going to make it right, that they weren't going to let things slide. Um, so it, it really became that uh, the odyssey of, of finding the, the child, the inner courage, the ability to, to look at the world from a certain point of view that I think Jean Louise had maybe lost over years of. Mm. Um, Did you feel it yourself? Not as, as, as just Irene Poole? Oh, yes, absolutely. It had a huge impact on me in, in, in many ways. You know, it... Uh, there is the obvious race relations, which are in Mockingbird that we are that we are dealing with in the story. Um, and I remember one night recently leaving a rehearsal uh, here in Stratford, and I watched my two uh, black 
castmates walk off and they said they were going to go have a beer. And it, it struck me sort of right in my heart where I went, oh, sorry, but I thought, I wonder if they are going to be treated differently when they walk into that bar in Stratford, Ontario, than my two white castmates who might go to a different bar. And hopefully they didn't. Hopefully they weren't being treated any differently. But I had that moment of going, my God, this is what they carry a history with them that I can only begin, begin, begin to understand a tiny amount. It's, it's, I, I can't, it's hard for me to remove um, my, myself from my work. Of course. Um, because like it's like it's a, there's, an, there's an accumulation of everything that I, everything that I, I do now and the art that I make has, has to, has to uh, be part of me and what my truism is, what my principles and my values are. And I think that uh, if if there's anything that I that I do on a regular basis, like it's uh, it's I, I I have great belief in in um, in that, that generations change, and um, and I spend a lot of time it, to um, to work with um, young artists, and I like I'm I'm in the process like I I think I have about 22 actors that I mentor, and um, and it's in. Uh, it's it's giving it's giving them the 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 empowerment to speak and the the empowerment to understand that they are uh, that that their voice is important and that they can um, change things. But so like I, I or if I can if I can go into university and uh, you know I, I I work at the York University University of Windsor and the National Theatre School and so whenever I have an opportunity to uh, to uh, to speak to young artists or just young people just to empower them and just to allow allow them the the, the passport that anything that they that they do c can matter um, there, because there is a there is a sense in in, in the younger generation that they're that they're locked into uh, electronics and 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 the and the ideology of of liking something is 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 being active in in that, that movement and and that's not always necessarily the case mm -hmm. if not at all and but also I'm I'm am I'm I'm a, I'm a dad yeah. and I I've I've two daughters and um and there's a, there's a, there's a responsibility that I that I feel to uh, to not only empower them as as, uh, as 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 women, but also as 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 a uh, as, as owners of of tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and they're also mixed race, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have to live they have to live through that. And sometimes they're um, sometimes you know we're aware of it, and and thank God they're not right now. But they're 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 going to be at some point, and I don't want them to be um, uh, sideswiped by that. But at the same time, you know we you want. We, I think that children need to be prepared for the world that they live in, but I also don't want to give them nightmares yeah. <laughs> or anything like that. And so I think that's it's it's just an, it's an engagement and understanding of the of the power of uh, of of our of our next generations of our of our young and yeah. and um, and I I think that I, I I enjoy and I think it's important to spend time inside that activity to em to empower them. And yeah, engage with it yeah. with 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 young people because we have seen over this this last uh, few years absolutely from the Parkland students to the young water keepers mm. to the Black Lives Matter movement to uh, these are youth. This is a this is a, a, a young movement. And when you talk about inner courage, these they are not messing around. Mm, yeah. I mean, it is just you know, for lack of a better term, balls out for them. Yeah, and we, we have a lot to learn from them. As we well. have so much to learn from them. And I wonder that, um, because you're all parents as well, about that next generation and how they're giving us the inner, you know, the okay to find our inner courage. So I'll ask you about that, Jesse, about your yeah. own as a father and as someone that has seen these, these youth movements and how they've they've raised up. What are you telling your kids and what can we learn from that, the the, the youth that we're say, seeing right now? Well, I think kids have an incredible divining rod for injustice, right? If you've ever, if you have, I have two kids. Mm -hmm. So if you ever have cut a cake oh, man. for two kids, <laughs> they're able to sniff out the inequality. <laughs> the, like The injustice that. of a size. Yeah, they're like, no, she got more than I did, Dad. <laughs> let's, let's cut. So they have, like, just innately, I Absolutely. think they... They get that, and they're also not, the, you know, burdened with, a, you know, experience and how that actually functions in the real world. So there's a certain um, clarity of vision around around injustice, uh, and certainly um, I find them, you know, deeply energizing. Although, uh, you know, when it comes to my kids, 
um, talking to them about what it will be to be indigenous in the world is something I've done since I've known them. Right. Uh, because it's not something my, I discussed with my parents. And I think, because I honestly don't think my parents really f knew, mm -hmm. you know, my, um, what it would what it would be like. I assume that, you know, I haven't really t ever talked to her about it, but I don't, my mom always said no, nope, because her life was sort of fine. Like, she mm -hmm. didn't face a lot of... I would recommend <clears throat> talking to her about it. I just we, did that we, recently we, with, my, with my parents. And, and she said, Very like, for like her, it. she was the exotic right. beauty at high school, so it didn't, you know, it didn't confront itself in the sa same way. And my dad is a white guy, so he's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, what did I know? I was a hippie trying to make sales and smoke pot in 1972. So, you know. And court the exotic girl. Ex and <laughs> marry the exotic looking girl. So I don't, but for them, I'm, I, you know, I wish I had given, been given a heads up a little bit. Like someone had said, just so you know, like people with badges are going to really take an interest in you just for existing. Mm -hmm. When I was thinking about this panel, about the idea of inner courage, it strikes me that the reason we frame it that way is because it, it requires people to come forward yes. to tell their stories. If, we, if this didn't happen, the truth is, including many people in this room, might not ever be aware that these things happened. You know, so I think of the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think of what that has done as a, as a, with my proximity to it as a, a man. Uh, I knew things were bad. I didn't realize how bad they were, just the overwhelming of it, you know, and, and I had, had never, it never even occurred to me to ask my wife, just like, every day, what is it like to just walk around? Mm -hmm. It hadn't, it, it didn't totally sink in, and so I think of the inner courage of the women it is to, because it is not beneficial, I would guess, to their lives to do this. Like, I think it's very, very difficult. It's hard. Very yeah. difficult to mm -hmm. come out with these stories. And that does take a, a real inner courage, because I'm not sure I've ever viewed what I do as, like, inner courage. I just, I, I've always viewed it as an obligation. Mm -hmm. My mother was very clear that it was... This is what we do. Yeah. Well, she was very clear that, like, listen, you're going to lead a privileged life, mm -hmm. especially compared to many other Indigenous folks. And there will be a time when you have to pay all of it back. Mm. But I also know that privilege, and I would say this to everyone in the room, is something you can give away. Yeah. It's that it is a beautiful thing. Like you can bestow it on others by just making the space and then sort of backing away. And that's an extraordinary thing. And I think more and more allies should really do that. It's like acknowledge that you have it and then give it all away because mm. it's, You'll still actually have it, is the funny thing. Like yeah. it, it won't ever really leave you, but you can give lots of it away. And, yeah, and like something, it, it doesn't have to be lonely. That's you right. Know, like, you know, like a, I think that being, being courageous can, can, can empower you and, and others. I think that, that for a, a number of individuals that, that exercise uh, courage and or, or come out to speak, uh, to speak up about in, injustice, it, it can be an, an incredibly uh, daunting and lonely you know, task to do that, but I, 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 I agree with you that if, you're, if, there's, if you have uh, loved ones around you or, or to, to support that, it, it, it doesn't, you, you never have to be alone if you're empowered. And if one feels that it is res a, 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 a responsibility and, and something that is, that is inevitably uh, done through the motive of, of love for others or mm -hmm. to empower others that are going to come behind you. Um, regardless of whether or not it's it's a people of color or other women, mm -hmm. uh, but the, in in which in what at what point do we have to put our foot down and say say no to injustice to to you know s you know stop stealing my voice yeah. uh, you know stop taking power away from uh, a, you know, people or a gender or or a non gender. You know? it, we, there was a in interesting um, some uh, interesting podcasts and I've read some things about how the Me, Me Too movement was a was really <coughs> A game of numbers when it mm. came down to it mm. that it wasn't that you know one person stood out it was that one person st stood up and then another person stood up behind them and another stood up mm -hmm. behind them and another and another until it was impossible for anyone to ignore what was happening mm -hmm. and I feel like that is sort of a, a, a part of what it means to be, be courageous you stand up you're at the dinner table someone says something inappropriate I'm all, I'll also I'll pretty much guarantee you that if you're feeling it 
someone else at that table is probably feeling that that was inappropriate as well. And just coming together with that in numbers is something important. Someone um, has asked, does society have too many movements? Are there too many things that we're trying to push, push up against? Well, they're all real, I suppose, yeah. so there can't be too many of them. I suppose it depends on which ones affect you personally or professionally that you engage with. Uh, personally, I think the, the Me Too movement for my industry was a complete game changer. Yeah. It changes every single room I've walked in since it, it happened. Um, and Stratford is very good about being, um, I mean, the Stratford Festival, uh, a leader in um, you know, workplace equality and respect. Um, but I feel that because of that movement particularly, there is no going back. Mm. There is no going back to a time, I believe, where women can feel that shamed and persecuted and mm. um, belittled. I just don't think it can happen anymore. Uh, partly because of um, uh, the, the, the eyes of other women and men who mm -hmm. are watching a, a room and a situation and uh, who are, I think, more willing to stand up and, um, and take a stand against that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. So, and the, it does feel like there are a lot of movements, but they all feel very necessary. But every, every, mov every movement is, a, is, is born and, and, and is a reaction out of wrongs and, and injustices. And I think that it's not, is there too many movements? Is, are there too many wrongs? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, I, you know, I think that, I think that it's like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it, it's an interesting you know, question to ask, but it's a, it's a terrifying reality that, that, there, that, that there, there has to be. You know, there's. I don't think there's anything. There's too many movements. There's like there's a there's a there should be m much more of a of a want to find the like the the cause of it all. You know, it's a it's a it's a it, it, sometimes it's sometimes it's overwhelming to to uh, take in the amount of lies and and crap and bullshit. I'm sorry that happens on that on on television and on the, in in politics and. And sometimes around the street, and and it's it's not it's not it's not the type of world that we that we uh, that we all want to live in. But it, it's it's something. Why 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 is this why is this cancer like why has it been let go? Why is it why is the test tube been 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 opened and it's and it's and it's spreading? I think the the, the movement is 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 in, is in direct correlation to the to the to the to the darkness that we're that we're that we're allowing to to take over and and live beside us. Sorry, I got a little angry there. No, I think <laughs> Don't apologize. And I, and I think yeah. that, you know, that feeling of, of being overwhelmed and that there's too many movements is actually a reflection of, like, that the overculture can often feel like it can only sustain a certain amount of change at any one time. Yeah. Right, so something I hear, for example, in this moment <coughs> from organizations is like, well, <clears throat> we're really confronting the women issue mm -hmm. So we can't really deal with indigenous right now, <laughs> you know, because this one is too busy. Or yeah. we're dealing with indigenous, yeah. so we can't really. You're right, because like it, it's overwhelming, it's, right? It's like, like we can we can com completely forget mm -hmm. about 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 like a, a nuclear threat in North Korea mm -hmm. because all of our energy and our our tears and 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 our our ulcers are bursting about all these children that are being torn <laughs> away from our our, our, our uh, their parents. Yeah. You know, and I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but no, you're absolutely it's right. It's just like there, there's just there's just so much to take in um, that 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 we that we do let you know the Me, the Me Too movement sort of like waver for a second because all of a, all of a sudden there's there's an, another shooting in, in a school, yeah. right? Or there's an, there's an, uh, there's another indigenous indigenous woman that's missing. I, I suppose the danger in being overwhelmed with all the movements is that we just <laughs> shut down and we, yeah, we right. shut it all out yeah. and go, I can't. I can't do anything about mm -hmm. all of this, so mm -hmm. I'm just going to do nothing. And, and what we should do is acknowledge that there that there's intersections that the the Me Too movement intersects <laughs> with the call for indigenous sovereignty and rights. They're mm -hmm. there because the attack on indigenous women, mm -hmm. which is a historic one, mm -hmm. is directly rooted in undermining our nationhood <laughs> and our sovereignty. So they're there, and that we that's the whole point. So that it's good that there is actually all these movements because they're. Maybe at the first time in a while, they're highlighting those intersections, mm -hmm. or they should be for us. Absolutely. They should be pointing to us and say, because as Dr. King said, you know, can I truly be free <laughs> if you're not? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I cannot. Mm -hmm. So my freedom intersects with the ability for women to have freedom, mm -hmm. for you to have freedom. Mm -hmm. 
so I can't pretend that I'm in a movement just for indigenous people. Mm -hmm. No, I have to, even when I sit in the room, that may be my primary goal, mm. but I'm always looking for everyone else too, because we, we, are, we do intersect at those places, so. I'm wondering about hope. And you know, after this conversation, um, the individual lives that we're living, there's a lot of, there's some, some, there's some despair. We're pushing back against things. Are we seeing hope? Where are we seeing the, the, the glimmers of hope? I'll start with you, Nigel, and I'll just come all the way down the, the line. I, I, I guess I, I, I hold the, the hope party line that I, I, I find it in our children. I find it in the, in the, the activation of, uh, of, of, their, of their voices and, and their, their, the questions that, that they ask. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think that I'm, I'm, in, I'm inherently hopeful. I think I get angry uh, and, and uh, I, I stay active because, it's because I'm, not, I'm not apathetic. And I think that that, that, is, that is because it's, I'm filled with hope. But I also mm -hmm. have a lot of, I have a, a great love for, uh, for, for tomorrow's voice. And that's our, that's our, you know, our, our kids. And, and, you know, whether they be, you know, 12 year old, 12 years old to, or 24, they're, they're still, they're still in the, in that, 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 that cusp of, of, uh, of blossoming to, to uh, vocalize their change and their wants. So that's where, that's where, that's where my, my hope is. That's, that's where I see it. Great. And, and as long as, and as long as there's, that we don't, we don't, surrender into apathy, then something will always happen. Yeah. I, I agree with Nigel. As a parent of two young people, I, uh, I, I see um, the wonder in them still for a, a great world to walk out into. I, I see little activists starting who want to make climate change go away. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hope, I, I do, I kind of think about my son, I think, well, maybe you will grow up and you will be the person who helps lead this climate change revolution. Mm -hmm. And we get back on track. Um, and I also, as an artist, have to hope that stories keep helping, that they keep yes. reaching people and we keep changing hearts and minds through storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. That's a lot of wisdom. Yeah, from, that's a lot. From those two. Um, I agree. I mean, I think it's our duty to give hope to our children. I think to do otherwise is to fail them. So I think it's, especially with Indigenous kids, so I mm -hmm. only want to feed them hope. And to be honest, sitting here, like these things did not happen, mm -hmm. you know, five years ago, mm -hmm. you know, or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Something like this is a, is a signal of that yeah. progress. And, and I think that's very hopeful. And I would answer in the same, can I answer the question too? Yeah, please, do. please. Um, I think that the hope lies in the fact that we, we are doing this and all of you have come out knowing that you are probably in, be in for a difficult conversation um, and you took the time to, to think about these things and, and go through this path with us um, because we're all, I mean, we're all in this together. So just the opening of your heart to have this conversation is hopeful to me.